Do you like Neptunia games, but you don't really like Neptunia? Well, have I got a game for you. I'm Adam Scott, and this is Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force. Developed by Compile Heart, Fairy Fencer F originally released in 2013 for the PS3 and PC. A remastered version was released for PS4 in 2016 titled Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force, which made a number of improvements to the visuals, story, characters, and rebalanced combat. This is the version I played on my PS5. Now, when jumping in, there are a few things you'll notice right off the bat. The game's anime aesthetic and light fan service elements will likely attract as many players as it deters. The combat system looks suspiciously like that of Hyperdimension Neptunia, and it takes itself a bit more serious than you may be used to for a Compile Heart game, but with a charming and zany cast of characters that help to balance things out. So, is it worth your time? Well, within the first few minutes, you'll get a crash course about the world and the stakes. A world that was once the battleground for the vile god and the goddess, who have been since sealed away. Special swords, called Furies, can be found all across the land, and it's up to special individuals called Fencers to collect these weapons, in order to resurrect one of these all-powerful deities. Fencers wishing to bring peace and prosperity to the land are working to resurrect the goddess. And of course, those with darker intentions have their sights set on resurrecting the Vile God. Well, duh. Inside each fury lives a fairy, a magical being that imbues the fencers with abilities and attributes. Got it? Good. We're introduced to Fang. In an attempt to get free food, he pulls a sword out of a stone, which not only ends up being a fury containing a fairy named Eren, but also turns him into a fencer. Eren urges Fang to collect more furies, and as hesitant as he is, we're now off on our adventure. All the traditional RPG storyline beats are here. The reluctant hero, the quest to save humanity that requires him to overcome his shortcomings, an evil corporation, and a group coming together for a common cause. The game presents the story through tons of recorded audio files and mostly static dialogue scenes. Mouths are animated and emotions are shown through facial expressions and anime emotion markers. Those familiar with Compile Heart games, and particularly the Neptunia games, will be familiar with this style of humor, cheeky and on the nose, with some fan service sprinkled in and occasionally breaking the fourth wall. Upgraded from the original, some more shallow character storylines have been expanded, giving them more reason to be here. The biggest addition from the original are the two extra endings. In the PS3 version, there was a goddess to save, and that was pretty much it. Now you can choose which to resurrect, the vile god, or take a twist that leads to the evil goddess ending. This changes the last two thirds of the story, giving the plot ways to divert into more exciting stories. It adds more weight and player agency to the resurrection mechanic that the original game lacked. The game is structured in two distinct parts. There's the hunt for furies, which requires dungeon exploration, lots and lots of fights, hunting down supplies and gear, and squaring off against a boss at the dungeon's end and there's the interactions between Fang and the other characters that make up the lion's share of its narrative. This portion of the game plays out a lot like a visual novel. There is zero exploration or any real player control. All interactions are handled via menu screens. Choose the location to visit, like a store or inn, and select who to talk to. These interactions between Fang and the party are how the story is driven forward. Fang is great. He's our self-absorbed, egocentric protagonist. He doesn't really care about anything, like at all other than snacks maybe, which is pretty funny considering just how much everyone else goes on and on about the importance of everything. The supporting cast grows rather large, and they make the story quite enjoyable. Throughout the game, you'll meet new party members, both good and evil, who will join the team across the game's multiple routes. While they're all interesting in their own way, Fang is without a doubt the standout. It's not common in games like this to have a balance of both male and female characters, particularly ones who are playable, but this game does a nice job of giving you lots of choices to work with. There's a lot of text in this game, which features main events and sub-events full of conversations between the characters. These weren't so bad considering the English audio is a cut above and does a good job of bringing the scenes to life, and there's also Japanese audio if that's your thing. Conversations are usually comical, but the game does have some serious moments that reveal a side of Fang that's actually pretty respectable. I enjoyed the interactions between the characters, and since their connections feel genuine, I really came to enjoy the cast. Also, Tiara is the best girl. Just saying. You'll spend most of your time navigating the dungeons and fighting enemies. 
To open up new regions, you'll have to stab a Fury into the ground. This not only unlocks the area for you to travel in, but also imbues the region with the positive and negative attributes of the Fairy inside. This is called world shaping. For example, you may get a 10% boost to your experience, but physical attack damage will drop by 10%. Clever use of world shaping can really help you when you need to grind for experience or gold, especially to purchase some endgame gear and abilities. In the field, you can attack preemptively if you're fast enough, allowing you the first turn in battle. And the opposite is true if an enemy gets the drop on you. The battle scenes are reminiscent of the Hyper Dimension Neptunia series, where characters are placed in the field and have a range of motion and a bevy of attacks to take enemies down. The combat is turn-based, with an on-screen turn order and a variety of basic hits, magic attacks, special abilities, and items at your disposal. Basic attacks go directly in front of you, while special attacks can arc in front of you or radiate from your body. This means that with the right planning, you can group your enemies and really lay down damage. At times, you'll find yourself in that familiar RPG hamster wheel, where many fights play out almost identically as you find an effective combination that becomes repetitive after a while. But finding that groove and getting through battles unscathed can be very satisfying. Improved from the original, you can now bring six characters into battle at one time, instead of only three, with the difficulty and mechanics adjusted accordingly. While the rank and file enemies can get repetitive, the bosses are the perfect challenge for the bigger team size, and some in the late game are downright brutal. There's a litany of nuances that play into the combat system. The most important one is Fair Eyes, where a fencer will fuse with their fury in fairy. This can be activated when the tension gauge has been filled and gives the character a new form for a limited time, adding some extra oomph to the attacks, and even enabling a few fair eyes only abilities. During tougher boss fights, fair eyes is invaluable. Why do they get stabbed by their fury? Alifano, sir. <laughs> Destroying an enemy's guard gauge can open them up to an avalanche attack, in which all the characters pile on to bash one after the other. Each character also has a unique special ability, like Harley's Analyze or Ethel's Assassinate. The list could go on, but it already illustrates the point that there's a lot that's thrown at the wall to see what sticks. Perhaps a bit too much, considering there's rarely any need to go beyond physical and magic attacks, with the occasional fair eyes thrown in. The rest generally just becomes background noise rather than a key way to strategize fights. Even with everything at your disposal, this game is no walk in the park and can often test your skills in battle, particularly in the late game. You can always adjust down the difficulty if needed, but how you upgrade your characters and their abilities can be the key to leveling the playing field. Starting with weapons, each one can attach a Fury card, which adds effects and buffs to the character. As you use them in fights, they'll level up and get more powerful. I found myself swapping Furies often to ensure they were all leveling up equally and since you're constantly adding new Furies, I was able to test out their effects. Furies are given a rank that usually address their power level, but they're all pretty unique and their designs reminded me of Magic the Gathering. Winning a battle nets each character not only gold and experience, but also weapon points. Weapon points can be used to upgrade a character's basic stats, like physical attack, magic attack, and range. Yeah, without upgrading your range, you're like a T-Rex with those short little attacks. Weapon points can also be traded in to unlock new skills, abilities, magic spells, and combo moves. It's a really flexible system that gives you the ability to create the exact character you want. You can even customize the order of moves in your combos, so you can decide whether you want to launch an enemy in the air or hit them on the ground. And this is actually important, considering the follow-up move may be more powerful depending on the preceding move. While I appreciate the depth, at times it felt like the game was trying to do too much. Like the developers had a kitchen sink and thought, why not throw that in too? And that's because many of these systems, while seemingly important at first, are more or less busy work that weren't nearly as important in the heat of battle. I know this sounds rather negative, but I actually enjoyed the combat system quite a bit once I learned and focused on what was most essential. What I found less fun was what ultimately feels like padding. You'll end up visiting the same dungeons a number of times. Picture this for each dungeon you'll clear the dungeon for the first time to gain a fury. Then you'll clear it a second time a short while later for an alternate boss and an alternate fury. But you're not done. You'll return to the same dungeon a half dozen or more times as part of fetch or kill quests. Oh yeah, you'll actually time travel back to the beginning of the game and repeat this process again. Yeah, call it repetitive, call it padding. It's too much of the same thing. It's just tedious, particularly if you plan multiple runs through the story for completion's sake. 
Luckily, most of the combat can be completely avoided by simply dashing past enemies on the map, sometimes waiting for them to turn their backs. Entire dungeons can be simply run through with a minimum of enemy encounters, though of course no experience or weapon points will be collected like this. It's not the best selling point to say that you can skip parts of the game, but it allows you to manage the tedium and speeds things up considerably. While that isn't great, there is a lot to like about the presentation. But keep in mind, this is a remastered PS3 game and it feels like a remastered PS3 game, so textures and some detail will feel a few generations old. The level design is pretty simple, with themes like lava, sand, and a crumbling tower that differentiates them. The character designs are really where the game shines. Each have a lot of detail and personality. The female characters, both fencers and fairies alike, tend to embody different fantasy tropes, from prim and proper Tiara, who gets a tingly feeling when she's verbally put in her place, to Harley's salacious habit of shedding her pants. However, the characters' portrayals are good-natured, often humorous, and can be forgiven for their stereotypical traits. The voice acting is really a cut above. As I mentioned before, you'll be watching pretty lengthy visual novel-type cutscenes. When you're playing a game with as much going on as this, it's hard to sit and watch static characters move their mouths to dialogue. I can read a lot faster than the characters can speak, so I found myself skipping forward a lot more toward the end. Since this is a PS3 game, remastered for the PS4, and playing on the PS5, the performance, as expected, was fine. No issues at all. For those completionists out there, to get the Platinum Trophy, you'll need to play the game three times, one for each of the story paths. After finishing a story for the first time, a New Game Plus mode becomes available, allowing you to carry over levels, abilities, equipment, and so on, but tackle a more serious challenge while experiencing a different outcome to the story. Because of this, even though the repetitive dungeons can be a slog during the first run, your two subsequent runs are far faster. I'd also absolutely recommend doing the Goddess run first, as that will be the easiest path to take. All in all, you're looking at about 60 hours of gameplay. Straight up, Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force isn't for everyone. It's a niche JRPG, but those of us who are into this type of game, there's a lot to get out of it. It's got a great art style and music, charming characters, and a story that gets really interesting the further you progress. While I wish the combat and accompanying systems were streamlined a bit more, and the dungeon started to feel like deja vu, but in the end I had a lot of fun. If you're looking for a JRPG off the beaten path, you should definitely check out Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force. Okay, you've heard my take on Fairy Fencer F Advent Dark Force, and I'd love to hear yours as well. Also, what's another RPG we should all check out? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. Now, if you like the video, hit like and subscribe. And if you want a fresh take on a Neptunia game, check out my video right here. I want to thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.